Please stand and let's read together the earliest recording uh, testimony of the resurrection that we have actually comes from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 8. Let's read out loud together. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Thank you. Please be seated. It is Resurrection Sunday all over the world, and people are gathered in every nation, tribe, and tongue to once again remember the story and to reflect upon the incredible significance of this historical claim that the tomb is empty, that Christ is risen. This singular claim in history changed the world, and it continues to change lives all over the globe. Millions of people every day all over the world go through their life, make decisions and choices every day based upon the belief that Jesus Christ rose again on the third day. It, it, it informs the way they spend their money, the way they raise their kids. But there are millions of people who have never heard about the resurrection or they have dismissed the historical claim of Christ's resurrection and they are making choices and living their lives every day as though there is no God or according to whatever they believe to be true about other gods and other religions. This week, we're reminded of the very serious ramifications regarding what we believe happened over 2,000 years ago. As we learned on Thursday that 148 Christian college students were slaughtered in Kenya by Al-Shabaab, a Somalian Muslim terrorist group. The number of Christians martyred this year is now well over 100,000 in many parts of the world. Believing that Jesus rose again from the dead makes you a target. And I think it would be appropriate for us to just take a moment and to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering on account of their faith in Jesus Christ. Can we pray for just a minute? Lord, our hearts are profoundly moved as we even for a moment begin to imagine what it would be to be a survivor or a family member of those whose lives were taken simply because they identified themselves with our Lord Jesus Christ, because they believed that he rose again from the dead, that they were willing to self-identify as your followers, knowing full well that it would lead to their death. This is the case all over the world today, particularly in the Middle East, North Africa, and now East Africa. And we pray for those faithful saints, those believers, those families. We pray that you would minister to them, that you would help them to stand even in the midst of such terrible tragedy. And I pray that we would not take for granted the liberties that we have to have public assembly as the body of Christ on this Easter Sunday. Lord, have mercy. Help the world to see that you are there. Help the world to embrace Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. And help those of us who have embraced this truth to endure and to persevere and to bear witness to what is true. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You know, what happens in history matters a lot. What we believe to be true about what happened, you know, 2,000 years ago continues to deeply inform our worldview. And over the course of the past several weeks, I've been attempting 
tempting to teach on this concept of worldview and how important it is for all of us to consider why we believe what we believe. Because what we believe to be true dictates the decisions we make, the people we're becoming, and the society that we're becoming. I've asked you to think about your worldview as a house with four walls. And those four walls are going to be the same for all of us. We will have the wall of science, the wall of theology, the wall of philosophy, and the wall of history. You may not spend much time thinking about these walls, but rest assured, we all go through each day making decisions based upon what we think is true in all four of these areas. But in addition to the four walls of your worldview that is pretty much universal for everybody, we have a foundation that we're building these four walls upon. And that foundation consists of the basic, essential assumption about what is always true in regards to the big ultimate questions. In other words, is God there or not? Are we accidental and personal creatures resulting from randomness and an incomprehensible conglomeration of time and chance? Or are we here because a personal God created us as personal creatures? What happens when we die? Do we simply stop existing? You see, how we think about these ultimate questions serves as the foundation upon which we're going to build the four walls of our worldview. I can't take credit for this picture of the house that we're building. Again, uh, that comes straight from Jesus Christ in Luke 6 when he says, Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. So we're all building a house, and our houses will be tested. The question is, when your house is tested, will it stand? That is a question we must all take quite seriously. And so we've been examining each of the four walls and asking the question, do the walls of science, theology, philosophy, and history, these different disciplines of thought, do they stand firmly upon Jesus Christ, what he said in a biblical worldview? Is there a better foundation upon which we should construct our lives? And thus far, I've given attention to the wall of science and the wall of theology this morning quite appropriately. I think we're going to turn our attention to the wall of history. History, according to Webster's Dictionary, is an account of what has happened. And much of our learning is based upon history, and we know this from our own experience. For example, you only need to accidentally pump diesel into your gasoline engine once. And then you have some history in that area. And you'll probably never do that again, right? If you've been married more than five years, you probably have history that helps you to negotiate the question, do these pants make me look fat? <laughs> you, only need to get, you only need to get that question wrong once. And <laughs> a little history goes a long ways when it comes to learning. And not only for us, but those who will come after us. My teenage son just began driving and... Uh, you can imagine what lessons he gets from the old man, right? I mean, it's all the lessons that I learned from my tickets and my accidents, which means he's had a lot of learning. Uh, I mean, we've all been shaped by our history. And, and things have happened in our lives. Things have happened around us that accounts for where we are right now and, and who we are and who we're becoming. For example, did you know, do you remember that on December 19th, 1980, I was nine years old, and the prime interest rate reached an all-time high of 21.5%, which is astronomical. Right now, the prime rate is 3.25%. Now, why would I appeal to that history? Why would I even remember? Who, what nine-year-old remembers what the prime interest rate was when they were, you know? Well, I do. You see, because my parents co-owned a real estate company in a little town in Shawnee, Wisconsin, just outside of Green Bay. And my parents tried to write out the highest interest rate in American history, but it didn't work out very well. Turns out nobody wants to buy or sell houses when the interest rate is at 21.5%. And that went on for four years. So in 1984, my parents lost everything. They lost their business. We lost our home. And uh, we had four teenagers at the time. By, by the time, you know, we, we finally lost everything, I was 13 and... So we, we sold everything we had, and uh, four teenagers and a dog, and mom and dad packed up, and we moved south to Charlotte, North Carolina to start our lives over again, which led me to attend Providence Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. And my relationship with that pastor led me to attend Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, and there I met my wife. 
And I was encouraged by my professors there to go to Princeton Seminary. And when I went to Princeton Seminary, I lost my faith, and I found my faith in three years. And that led me back to a little Baptist church in North Carolina, and then a friend of my wife's family talked me into taking a job in a Presbyterian church in South Carolina, which led me to take this job seven years ago. So 21.5% interest in December of 1980 has a lot to do with who you have to put up with this Easter morning. <laughs> History matters a lot. History helps us to understand how we got to where we are. Now, in addition to the facts of history, how we build our personal wall of history depends upon the foundation. In other words, when I tell the story of my family and the prime interest rate, I usually will tell that story based upon a biblical worldview foundation. So I interpret those events through the conviction that God was there, that God was working all these things together for my good, to accomplish his purpose in my life, to shape my character and to get me where he wanted me to be, to move me into a place where I would meet my wife and follow the path that he'd planned for me in advance. That's how our family actually thought of that time in our lives. We prayed a lot. We trusted that God was going to use our financial devastation for some higher, greater purpose. So basic history tells us what happened, but we choose how to interpret or how to understand that history as part of our worldview based upon the underlying foundation of what we believe is always true. Now, I tell you this because Christianity, at first, is a basic historical claim. It's based upon a basic historical claim. Every bit of Christianity hangs upon Easter, the historical claim that Jesus Christ rose again on the third day and was seen by multiple witnesses following his public execution on a Roman cross. I know you probably think Christianity is a lot more complicated than that, and it certainly can be, but if you strip it all down to the most basic concept, Christianity depends upon the historical claim of the resurrection. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Now, if you want to know what makes me tick as a pastor and a theologian, if, if you want to know how I deal with a world of complexity and competing claims of truth, how I deal with corruption in church history and angry atheists, why I continue to hold firm when there is so much pressure to throw aside all convictions and simply go along with the cultural drift. I will tell you, for me, in the dark night of the soul, it all comes down to one question. Did Jesus raise from the dead or not? And that's what I say to myself in the midst of whatever situation I'm in that causes me to have great doubt and consternation or fear or whatnot. I simply ask myself that question, did Jesus Christ raise from the dead or not, because if Jesus Christ rose again on the third day, then, then what? Then God is there. Jesus is the son of God. God created the heavens and the earth. God makes the rules, I don't. I've broken God's rules, I need to say I'm sorry. God loves me, Jesus died for me, Jesus conquered death, and Jesus, I'm forgiven and adopted into God's family. The Bible can be trusted and God speaks to me in the Bible. I'm here for a purpose. This life is not all there is. I'm going home and when I die, I'll get to see my loved ones who've gone on before me. This life is all about God's glory, not mine. Everything I have belongs to God. Everybody needs Jesus, so my mission in life is to make Jesus known and to make disciples of all nations, whatever the cost. It just all goes from there. If Jesus rose again, then... Now, you may not look at Christianity that way. That may, not, that may not be the way it works for you. You may be drawn to Christianity for other reasons. You may reject Christianity for other reasons. But rest assured that we must contend with the historical claim of the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus Christ because if it's true, it changes everything. It informs everything, explains everything, and should rightfully determine the way that we live our lives, make choices, spend money, raise our kids, and so on. Now, I will admit to you that the resurrection of Christ should be considered a unique claim in history. Critics of Christianity would suggest that since the resurrection is an exceptional claim, that it defies the laws of nature, and since it cannot be observed and has never been observed, that it should not be believed, 
that the resurrection of Christ actually happened. But that is a silly concept. You know what? Everything in history only happened once. Even if similar events happen regularly. For example, lots of people get married all the time. I got married on August 6, 1994, at approximately 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in Crozet, Virginia. The reliability of whether or not I got married on August 6, 1994, does not hinge on whether or not people get married all the time or not. To determine if my historical claim is true, we must consider the evidence, like eyewitnesses and documents and wedding rings. And yes, I did get the wedding ring fixed. Uh, those of you who knew that I let my wife's wedding ring remain unfixed for a year. Okay, moving on. <laughs> so, history always works this way. History is not about observable, repeatable observation. History demands a different set of tools to determine whether it actually happened or not. Now, uh, I know that many of you would say, I already believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead on the third day. And then some of you, especially on an Easter Sunday as you come in with your family, you're thinking, I have serious doubts. But... I want to ask you, why do you believe and why do you doubt? Have you thought about that? What I want you to see is that what you believe to be true about this, this particular historical claim has such massive, huge ramifications that whether you believe it or whether you doubt, you would do well to dig in and actually determine why you believe or why you doubt based upon the evidence that is available. And whether you like it or not, I'm going to take you through a quick tour about some of that evidence. And I know I need to do a quick disclaimer because some of you are thinking, oh, not today. I just want to, you know what? I don't care about the history. I, I just want you to get this over with. Make me laugh. Make me cry. Help me solve my problems. Tell me to be nice to people who are different than me. I mean, give me something. Listen, listen. If Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, this particular singular truth will absolutely speak into every question, every need, every pain, every diagnosis of cancer, every loss of a loved one, everything, everything hinges upon this one particular truth. It speaks to your job, your lack of job, how we respond to enemies who attack us and kill us, how we should think of the poor, our children, marriage, divorce, our neighbors, our in-laws, ourselves, everything about our society, our health, our hope, our relationships, our past, and our future hinges on the empty tomb, all of it. You, you, you cannot simply summarily dismiss this as just yet a historical claim. If Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, it makes him the son of God. It makes him the authority over all things and all people in all times and all cultures. It is that big of a deal. And, and I will tell you right now that an awful lot of people who attend church somewhat regularly really don't know what they believe about the resurrection. They certainly don't know why. And so I will give you a little bit of information to help you understand why I believe the historical event of Christ's resurrection actually happened and I will tell you that, you know what, pastors and theologians and people, I mean, we operate upon this information all the time, but if a pastor doesn't give you that information or, or show you where you can go read about it yourself, then you're working on just, well, something maybe that you've read on a, on a YouTube, you know, a blog or something. And, and so I want you to have some tools to understand why intellectually it's a very solid case to believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. Let me just take you through it very quickly. Obviously, the primary evidence regarding the resurrection is the witness of the four gospel accounts that describe the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ along with the rest of the New Testament that confirms the resurrection of Christ and how's, you know, tells how that movement called Christianity formed around this historical event. So the first step is to read the documents. <laughs> you know, so many people want to dismiss Christianity. They've never actually read the evidence, the four gospel accounts. Many skeptics have literally come to the faith because they actually sat down and read the four Gospels. They read the New Testament. It's very compelling evidence. But I know that many people will challenge you on that. They'll say, well, I just don't believe in the Bible. But it is a fair question to say, well, why? Well, you, you know, you'll hear people say, well, it was written hundreds of years after the facts, and, and who knows what happened. It was really the church 
You know, I mean, some people think the Pope wrote the Bible. I mean, people have all kinds of misconstrued ideas. So I just want to tell you that scholars for many hundreds and even thousands of years have applied, a, you know, tests to the four Gospels, to the New Testament to discern, can it be trusted as history? And there's three primary tests that we apply to any ancient documents to consider if they're historically trustworthy. The first criteria is what we call just a biographical test. It's an examination of the textual transmission by which ancient documents reach us from the past. In other words, since we don't have the original manuscripts, we have to ask the question, how reliable are the copies that we have? How many manuscripts have survived? How consistent are they? What is the time interval between the original and what we call the extant or the existing copies? By the way, we apply these tests to all forms of ancient literature. So let me just give you a little perspective. The history of Thucydides, the great Greek historian, dated 400 to 460 BC, is available to us from eight manuscripts dated from around AD 900. That's 1,300 years between the time of the events and the earliest copy that we have, and we have eight copies. The manuscripts of Herodotus are likewise late and scarce. Nevertheless, these ancient historians are spoken of as reliable sources of ancient history in our schools and universities all over the world. Aristotle wrote his poetics about 343 BC, and yet the earliest copy that we have dated is, uh, that we have is dated at AD 1100. That's a gap of 1400 years between the time that the events are said to have taken place and the most recent copy, I mean the earliest copy that we have, and we have 49 manuscripts of Aristotle's The Poetics. Caesar's history regarding the Gallic Wars that took place in 58 to 50 BC is based upon 10 copies dating 1,000 years after his death. That's the earliest copy that we have. Everyone here knows that I love the first century Jewish historian Josephus. We have nine manuscripts of his work, The Jewish War. These copies depicting the events of the first century were written in the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries. Nevertheless, in all these instances I've just quoted to you, we teach the history from these sources as fact in our schools and universities. Now let's compare the evidence of the New Testament with those classic ancient documents that I just mentioned. We have now currently over 5,600 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament and over 20,000 ancient manuscripts altogether when we include copies found in Syriac, Latin, Coptic, Coptic, and Aramaic languages. In comparison, the Iliad is in second place with 643 copies. 20,000 versus 643. We have 18 manuscripts of the New Testament dated to the second century. And very recently, according to Dr. Daniel Wallace at Dallas Theological Seminary, a new manuscript of Mark has been found in 2012 that has been dated to the first century which means that the New Testament was clearly written and in distribution within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses of the events that took place. Consider that the earliest copy that we have of the Iliad is 500 years after it was said to be published. Jewish scholar Jacob Klausner says, if we had any ancient sources, like those in the Gospels for the history of Alexandria or Caesar, we should not cast any doubt upon them whatsoever. Craig Blomberg, former senior research fellow at Cambridge University in English, England, who went on to be a professor of New Testament at Denver Seminary, states that the New Testament texts have been preserved in far greater number and with much more care than have any other ancient documents. He concludes that 97 to 99% of the New Testament can be reconstructed beyond any reasonable doubt. Greek scholar J. Harold Greenlee writes, since scholars accept as generally trustworthy the writings of the ancient classics, even though the earliest manuscripts were written so long after the original writings and the number of extant manuscripts is in many instances very small, it is clear that the reliability of the text of the New Testament is likewise assured. So clearly the New Testament passes the biographical test, particularly in comparison with other ancient classics that we widely accept as historically reliable. The next test is what we call the internal evidence test. Whereas we should be confident we have accurate copies of the Gospels in the New Testament, we now must ask if the content in the New Testament is actually reliable. In other words, did the writers of the New Testament have the capacity to tell the truth? This test will look at the writer's ability to tell the truth based upon their geographical proximity to the events that took place, as well as the amount of time that elapsed between when the events happened and when they were recorded. 
We also look to see if the records contradict themselves uh, or blatantly get historical things wrong that can be verified by other means such as cross-referencing archaeology and so on. And I don't have time to go into all the details, but listen, when you do this research, what you'll find is that many historians, secular and religious alike, admire Luke as a fine and trusted historian of the highest order in antiquity. Dr. John McRae, a scholar at Wheaton College, writes, the general consensus of both liberal and conservative scholars is that Luke is a very accurate historian. He's erudite, he's eloquent, his Greek approach is classical quality, he writes as an educated man, and archaeological discoveries are showing over and over again that Luke is accurate in what he has to say. In addition to that, you know, many scholars will point to the fact that when the Gospels were written, they were forged in the presence of hostile opponents who would have seized the opportunity to refute the claims if they were not, in fact, public knowledge at the time. Hostile witnesses create accountability to testimonies, and that works to validate the Gospel accounts. But probably the most compelling internal evidence is what historian Will Durant observes about the embarrassing facts included in the Gospels that completely defy any claim of myth or legend. Let me read this. He says, from his perspective, the Gospels record many incidents that mere inventors would have concealed. The competition of the apostles for the high place in the kingdom, their flight of the disciples after Jesus' arrest, Peter's denial, the failure of Christ to work miracles in Galilee, the references of some people saying that they thought he was insane, his early uncertainty as to his mission, his confessions of ignorance as to the future, his moments of bitterness, his despairing cry on the cross. Durant says, you know, no one reading these scenes can doubt the reality of the figure behind them, that a few simple men should in one generation have invented so powerful and appealing a personality, so lofty an ethic, and so inspiring a vision of human brotherhood would be a miracle far more incredible than any recorded in the Gospels. After two centuries of higher criticism, the outlines of the life, character, and teaching of Christ remain reasonably clear and constitute the most fascinating feature in the history of Western man. I mean, did you hear that? D do you understand now why Jesus in the resurrection cannot be summarily dismissed or set aside as though science or skepticism or progress has somehow rendered him irrelevant or insignificant to our lives? Our worldview and particularly the historical wall of our worldview must deal with this man, Jesus Christ, and the claim that he rose again on the third day because the, the evidence is compelling. Finally, we'll apply the external evidence test. And very shortly, th th here's where we look to see if other historical material confirms or denies the internal testimony of the documents themselves. Very little time here, but look. You should know the name Papias. This is a bishop of Herapolis dated to A.D. 130. This would be within 100 years after the death of Christ or so, a little less, who wrote very specifically about his knowledge and his relationship with the Apostle John. He quotes the Apostle John as describing how Mark wrote his gospel as a result of spending time with Peter. Another disciple of John named Polycarp was quoted by his student Irenaeus in A.D. 180 speaking specifically to how the Gospel of Matthew was written among the Hebrews in their own language, how Mark was the translator for Peter, how Luke was influenced by Paul, and how John wrote his Gospel while he was in Ephesus. Again, these writings are clearly dated in the early and mid-2nd century, which means clearly that the writing of the four Gospels had taken place much earlier. They were in wide distribution at that time. There's a guy named Gary Habermas who wrote a very scholarly work entitled The Historical Jesus, Ancient Evidence for the Life of Christ. And he actually very painstakingly documents all of that and bears witness to the fact that there's external evidence confirming the crucifixion of Jesus by the Romans, worship of Jesus as deity, belief in the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus being the brother of James, and the empty tomb. Archaeology also contributes to the external evidence. Archaeologist Joseph Free writes, Archaeologists has confirmed countless passages which have been rejected by critics as unhistorical or contradictory known facts. But Clark Pinnock sums all of this up beautifully. He says, there exists no document from the ancient world witnessed by so excellent a set of textual and historical testimonies and offering so superb an array of historical data on which an intelligent decision may be made. An honest person cannot dismiss a source of this kind. Skepticism regarding the historical credentials of Christianity 
is based on an irrational bias. What he means by that is, if this kind of evidence, this textual evidence, internal evidence, external evidence, if that was around anything other than something that talked about God, it would be completely a slam dunk, 100% reliable history. The only reason that we would dismiss the New Testament as anything other than solid, clear historical witness is because it mentions the supernatural. And so a lot of people dismiss it because they have a bias against the supernatural. It's an unfair bias. Now, there are many reasons that I believe in Jesus, but today we're talking about the wall of history, and I will tell you that there is solid evidence, very solid reasons to believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. And for me, listen, that's a game changer. As soon as we concede to the fact that this is reliable history and Jesus rose again from the dead, everything then will be colored by that truth. In fact, that, that moves from the wall of science and will completely actually become the foundation upon which you build your worldview. It has that much power and it deserves that much centrality in the way that we think of our lives and the way that we make decisions. If Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, you know, we're not alone. The Bible can be trusted, then God is there. I mean, it, it, there's so much about this truth that it, it must have rule and sway over the whole house of our worldview. And I want you to chew on this in lunch today. I mean, if you, if you took away the resurrection of Christ, does that, can you even make sense of history? I mean, think about it. Does Jesus Christ risen from the dead help you to understand your history, our history as a country, our history as creatures on this planet? Or does believing Jesus Christ rose from the dead hinder your understanding of history? I mean, try to account for why all of our lives are dated to the life of this Jewish carpenter if he did not raise again from the dead. Try to account for why we would know anything at all about Jesus if he did not raise from the dead. Try to account for why there would be over 20,000 ancient copies of the New Testament if something unprecedented and remarkable never even took place. I will tell you that Jesus Christ crucified in the resurrection of Christ is the only way that I can make sense of the history that can clearly be read about as well as my own history and the testimony of millions, millions of souls who have said with tears and all sincerity, he's not dead, he's alive. Jesus saved me. Jesus dispelled the darkness. Jesus healed me. Jesus spoke to me. Jesus set me free. I sensed the power of God's love all around me when I called upon the name of Jesus. You know, I mean, my story is history. You have to contend with that. And all of these stories, millions of stories, and the witness of students on Thursday who were willing at gunpoint to say, he's not dead, he's alive, and they knew they were shot and killed. We, we have to take these historical witnesses and account for them. Were they all wrong? You know, I mean, are, are we all suffering from the God delusion? If Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, then what? What does that mean to you? Fill in the blank. What would that mean about the decisions you're going to make when your feet hit the ground tomorrow? You know, I think for a lot of us, that bothers us. What are you afraid of? If Jesus Christ actually is there, if he rose again from the dead, what do you think that might cost you? You know, I, I think many of us, we, we turn away from the historical evidence because we don't want it to be true. But have you ever considered the possibility that God has not pursued you because of what he wants from you, but God has pursued you your whole life because of what he wants for you? Let me ask you one more question. How's your house holding up these days? Have you been through a tough time of testing? You know, have you built your house on a godless worldview only to see it come crashing down all around you during a season of testing? That's exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. But listen, he made a promise. He said that if we would build our house on him by simply coming to him, digging deep, listening to his words, putting them into practice, trusting him, he promised that our house would stand. 
That's what he wants for us. So I invite you this morning to take up that offer, to repent of your rebellion against God and receive the free gift of forgiveness that is offered to all through the blood of Jesus Christ crucified on the cross. And listen, Jesus took that cross for you. And to make sure that you and I would know that death does not win, he rose again on the third day and changed the world forever. That's Christianity. It's powerful. It's personal. And I'm not inviting you to get religious. I'm inviting you to fall into the arms of a loving, personal God who is here, who has pursued you, who has died for you, who will absolutely reconstruct your life into something that is beautiful, strong, and eternal, a house that will stand. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray that we will take very seriously the historical claim of the empty tomb and that we will allow it to shape every aspect of our lives. It validates you, it validates everything you said, and it is undeniably the most significant event ever said to have taken place in all of history, the cross and the empty tomb. And I just pray this morning that we would not be afraid to examine the evidence that we would be able to give reason for why we believe or we'd be able to give good, solid reasons for why we don't. And I pray that we would not shy away from doing exactly what you said, to dig deep. And I pray for those of us who do believe that we will look to our brothers and sisters around the world and that we too would have such courage to stand firm in the midst of persecution and challenge that we would bear witness to what is true with our lives, with our deaths, with our testimony. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.